Gophers. Hello, Gophers. There's lots of ways to say hello, Gophers. Here's another way to say hello, Gophers. And I can prove it. Um, this is uh, an amazing historic occasion. Um, I'm not used to success, so this is kind of a strange <laughs> feeling for me. Uh, it's incredible to me that, that Go has achieved a level of success that makes people want to get together and have a conference about it. Um, I think that's uh, wonderful, and I want to thank the organizers for putting this together, all of you for coming, and especially the entire community for making Go the success that it is. Um, a lot of factors, I think, contributed to that success. Um, you could argue that it's the features of the language, it's the lack of features in the language, it's the combination. Um, I also think it has a lot to do with the design, the way we went about designing it and how it turned out. Of course, a huge part of it is the, the people who worked on it and what they did. And the passage of time refining and making things happen. Um, and so today I'd like to um, take a look at that whole timeline and see what happened, how Go came to be, and uh, where we are today as a result of that process. And to do that, I'm going to take a look, a fairly detailed look, at two programs. They're both historic. One of them is probably the first Go program most of you ever saw. And the other is essentially the first Go program of any interest that we ever saw. So both of those are historic. And the first one is the old Hello World. Um, here's the original Hello World. It was written in B by Brian Kernahan in 1972. So this is the first Hello World anybody ever saw. Uh, this is what B looked like. It was kind of a, an interesting language compared to today. It was a typeless, word-based, interpreted language. Of course, it was the predecessor to C. You can see intimations of C in the syntax. But you can also see strange things like um, put char of A, where A is this weird uh, four-character integer. Uh, by name, and then put our bang star n as a quoted string. So the question is, why is there a quoted string for a new line, but a is four characters? You might wonder about that. I wonder too. I have no idea. But anyway, that's what it looks like. Um, some people think that Hello World came from BCPL, but I asked Brian about this, and he said, no, he asked Martin Richards about it, and Martin Richards said it wasn't him, it was Brian. So as far as we know, this is the first ever Hello World, 1972. Uh, here's the 1974 Hello World. This is the first Hello World I ever saw. This was in the Programming in C tutorial, again by Brian, written in 1974, and came as part of the Unix v5 distribution. And you can recognize that this is a C program now. It starts to look a lot like what I think, even those of you who don't know C, would recognize as a C program. There's printf, there's quota strings, there's braces, there's main. Um, huge leap forward in 1978, C had a book. And there was a big change between the Hello World there and the hello world there, which is it got a new line character. Uh, um, but you, this is the full source. You're still, for, for those of you in the know, this is still missing some pieces. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until the ANSI standardization effort, which happened around 88, that it started to look more like the, the uh, C of today uh, and include with an angled bracketed uh, std io.h on it um, is, is a is a mark that the library is now something you already talk about instead of sort of being implied. And this was actually written to the draft NCC. It hadn't quite been finalized yet when Brian and Dennis uh, rewrote the book for the, the NCC. And there's actually a book copy came out in early 88. Uh, it was uh, reworked slightly for later in that year when the NCC standard was finalized. And there was actually a change to the program, which is the appearance of void in the, angle, in the arguments domain. I was standing next to Ken when he learned about this, and he said out loud, you've got to put a void there. Um, but you do. You did. Um, and it was probably the one thing where, at the time, I thought C++ was better than C. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was uh, I said C99. It's really C89. I'm sorry. That's just a typo on the slide. Oh, this is C89. Um, OK. That's a lot of little hellos. Let's get to Go, which is the one that we're, we're here to talk about. Um, skipping ahead a few uh, generations of languages, lots, every language now starts with a hello world. It's basically where the world begins. I guess maybe the certain communities look at it differently. But certainly in this, this sort of branch of language world, hello world is the starting point of your learning a language. Um, the discussions for Go started in late 2007. And in early March 2008, uh, we started writing the draft spec. Um, 
And there was actually a compiler already underway by then just to have a, a, a playpen, uh, and Ken was working on that. It was actually generating C output, which was problematic to, because of various interactions. But it was good enough that the very, very first Go program was actually written with that, although it was so buggy and, and hard to make work that it almost doesn't count. But once the uh, specs started to come together, we could actually uh, write a proper compiler, generate native code, and it was time to write tests. And the very first checked-in test included this example. So this is the first hello.go, and it's dated June 6, 2008. And it looks different from the hello.go of today, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so you can see it looks a lot, a lot like it, but notice that, for instance, print has no parentheses on it. It was actually a keyword. Uh, and uh, main was an integer-valued function, and you had to explicitly return a zero. Um, but uh, we had no print, printing mechanism other than this built-in print. It's a bootstrapping thing, and that's why it's still there. I think if it hadn't been for bootstrapping, it wouldn't be there at all. Um, but uh, by June, we decided that since main was always going to return, if you could call that the clean return, so we got rid of the argument to main, made it uh, just be a, a nil attic function that returned nothing, and when it returns, you get an exit call. So that's, uh, what, June. But it's still got no parents on the print. The parents came in a couple months later in August um, where we were starting to clean up the language a lot. We wanted to get rid of these magic words, and print became just a pre-declared identifier as a built-in function, uh, not really any special status beyond that. And this version, I think, actually runs. So there's a working print. That's the first workable by today's standards, hello.go. But we're not done yet. On October 24th, 2008, I checked in a CL that read printf as we know and love it. And so from now on, we're talking about the printf version rather than the built-in print version of hello world, which is not actually the way the test, the, the test version runs, but it's the one we're going to talk about. And this is very close to today, except for two details. One is there's a, a lowercase p on the print, and there's a semicolon. But they went away. On January 15, 2009, after a long discussion, I'll talk about more in a minute, uh, casing went in to specify visibility, and so capital P came to printf. And for the first day or two, that looked so strange and weird, and we were kind of uncomfortable. But about two days later or so, we realized this is one of the best decisions we've ever made, this case for visibility. So that was a big step. And this one runs still. but. On December 11th, 2009, after the uh, open source release, which was in November, we finally got rid of the semicolons. So this is the printf hello world version that we all know and love. So um, it took us a while to get here. I mean, I've, I've gone through it in about five minutes. But there's really 32 years worth of hello, dot, hello world refinement. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, because there's a lot of history in that sequence. Um, but I want to make sure you understand that although talked about C and it, the hello world timeline starts with B and C. Go is not just some variant of C. It's actually profoundly different from C. We started from C, or the first mail ever between us about Go was from Robert and started with, we start from C. But it's got ideas from so many other languages, so many other threads of, of thought, some original things, uh, that I wanted to make sure that it's, I made it clear that there's a lot of influences on the language, both direct and indirect. Um, it looks most like C because that's where the statement and expression syntax comes from. But most of the semantics is, is, comes from other places. The declaration syntax is out of Pascal. The, the Virk languages modular, the various modules and Oberon's delivered something close to the package form, although again, it's a little different. Of course, the whole CSP branch of concurrent programming has a huge effect on Go. Uh, the semicolon rule was lifted right out of BCPL, which most of you have never even seen, let alone written in. Uh, the way the methods work is much closer to small talk than, say, Java or C++. Um, my great contribution is the two magic tokens, left arrow and colon equals. They came out of new squeak. Um, the IOTA keyword came out of EPL, kind of, sort of. And there's lots of other languages that were in the room we're talking about that influenced it, uh, either because of ways to do things or ways not to do things or how to think about things. And so I don't want you to, I really don't want you to think this is some C thing. It gets called that a lot, and I think it's a mistake. It's actually a language influenced by a tremendous rich history of languages, but unique unto itself. Uh, which brings us up to today. Here's, here's the hello.go that you, you 
No, I changed a couple of things here. First of all, I went back to Printland from Printf. Uh, I'll talk about why that I did that in a minute. Um, and also put in UTF-8 uh, in an interesting way by acknowledging uh, Japanese gophers, of which I think there are quite a few. Are there any Japanese gophers here today? Yes, good, okay. Um, so I'm gonna break this program down because it's trivial, you all know it, you all have seen it, and yet there's actually a lot of thought behind every single piece of this program. It has 16 tokens. You could probably figure out what those tokens are. I'm gonna talk about every token. Don't worry, there's more here than you think. First of all, package. Actually, I think packages might have been the thing that we spent the most time talking about in the design of Go because we knew how important it was. We knew that wrapping up things into a library used in a way that was controlled and stable gave you a chance to do things like solve build problems, deal with dependency issues. You had to control dependencies in order to get the build times to be fast, which was critical to us. You had to make the packages be clean because that makes programming a large possible with lots of groups sharing code and working together but without breaking through the walls between the components. Um, you wanted the package system to somehow express all the information needed in order to build. You didn't want to have make files or other fancy build systems necessary. You wanted the Go source to express what was really going on. We wanted to make sure the circular dependencies didn't happen because they, that controls the size of the binaries, the speed of compilation, how much linking has to happen. Um, there are no sub packages. I don't know, we, there was a little just talk about that. I don't really remember what the thinking was. But uh, even though there are sub directories in the hierarchy, they aren't sub packages. There's no such concept. Uh, every package is, is a unique standalone thing. We separated the idea of package name and package path. Pretty simple. It turns out to be profound in what, it, what effect that has. The whole idea of visibility being package level rather than type level, the way it is, say, in, in Java with public and private, uh, is a pretty big deal. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, most important, I think, something that I don't think most people really think about, you just use it. Within a package, you have the whole language at your disposal. This is because the visibility rules work the way they do, but also because we, we made it this way. When you're writing a package, you're basically writing a standalone Go program on all of its pieces. And you define the boundary of the package, which is what your clients are going to use. But inside, all, all the information is available to everybody. There's no so-called you know, information hiding. As Bruce Ellis once wrote, who am I supposed to be hiding it from exactly? I wrote both pieces. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I think that's actually an interesting design point. And of course, it came out of the modular uh, branch of languages, but it's very different from uh, many of the other common languages in use today. And so I think it's worth recognizing that package is actually kind of special to the way Go works. OK, the next token is main. Now, this is not the function main. This is the, the package named main. It's one place in the whole thing where the C legacy really shines through. That word just flowed from B to C to go directly. Um, it was originally called capital main. I have no idea why. I think it's my fault, but I don't remember why. I thought you wanted that to be capitalized. Anyway, it went away. Um, so there was originally a capital main package and a lower main function. And initially, that's how program execution began. Um, but what really matters is it's special because of the main package is the root of the initialization tree. It has nothing to do with where the program starts execution proper. It's actually how initialization works. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, import. Import is the next token. Import is the mechanism you use to load a package, how you get a library into your world. Um, unlike a lot of other ways it could be done, in Go we decided right up front, almost implicitly I think, that import would be defined by the compiler. The compiler would actually do the work of doing the import as opposed to say a text processor or, or some other mechanism. Um, we worked really hard to make sure that it, the design made it very efficient. For instance, the export data in a package is right at the, f the, f right at the beginning of the object code for the, for the package. So the compiler only has to read the very beginning of the file. It doesn't have to read the whole library in, in order to do the, the compilation. Uh, we worked hard to make it linear. I've talked about this a lot before. The this is the notion that you pull the dependency information up into the packages from your dependencies so that someone compiling against your package doesn't have to talk to the packages you depend on. It can get it all from doing the single import. That means that the number of files you open when you compile a program is just the number of, of packages you import plus the source file itself. It's also interesting uh, that you don't import a set of identifiers. You actually import an entire package. The concept of package being the thing you get is, is not, a, not exactly unusual, but it's different from the way a lot of things, other, <coughs> excuse me, the way a lot of other things work. I'd also like to point out that there used to be an export keyword 
Uh, that was how we originally controlled visibility. It was pretty unwieldy, and of course you know what we did to fix that in the end. But it was there for probably about a year. There's actually a seal that deletes it. That was kind of fun to watch go by. Okay, then we come to FUMPT, the string that is the package path. This is a very short package path, of course. It's in the, the core libraries. But it is just a string. It has no special meaning to the compiler. It's deliberately decided very early on that the import path, separate from the package name, would be just a string, and, and the language would not define the meaning of that string, so that we could change the meaning or put interesting information in it later if we chose to do so. And of course, URLs were what we had in mind, but who knows, maybe some other mechanism will come up. Um, there's already talk about doing versioning through the, UR, through the package path string, that kind of thing. That was always planned to be an open thing. It was not, it was just an explicit decision. This allows for future growth, which of course is exactly what's happening. Um, then the func keyword. Now, this was a big step from, from C. It's actually borrowed much more from the Pascal side of things because that's where most of the declaration syntax comes from in rough, rough strokes. Um, having a f an actual keyword introduce a function is very different from the C family. Of course, it's very common in a lot of other languages. Um, it makes it a lot easier to parse the language because a keyword really starts things going when you're going to do a declaration. You don't have to deal with, with figuring out whether it's a type or, a, or, a, or an identifier, what's going on. Um, and it's really important that Go be easy to parse. It makes tooling easier. It makes it easier to understand the programs when you just see them on the page. Uh, it also uh, makes it a lot easier to have things like function literals or closures because the grammar inside a function body is a lot easier to understand. Um, by the way, the original keyword was not func, it was function. Because that's what it is, it's a function. And it went away on a well-known date. Uh, this is a mail thread on February 6, 2008. Ken mailed Robert Griesemer and myself. Larry and Sergey came by tonight. We talked about Go for more than an hour. They both said they liked it very much. P.S. One of Larry's comments was, why isn't function spelled funk? <laughs> so I responded, I mean, why not? This sounds good. We already had type and const. Why not just shorten function down to funk and fit right in? Uh, Robert objected a little bit because he thought it wasn't important, but he rapidly came around. And so I think the next day, function got shorter. So you can thank Larry for those keystrokes going away from the program. <laughs> Okay, the next main token, this is the function name. Uh, and it is where the program starts executing, of course, except there really isn't. What's important here is initialization. That happens before main starts. And in fact, the whole story about how initialization works in Go had been rattling around, particularly in Ken's mind, for a long time. Um, before Ken left Bell Labs, which was about the year 2000, maybe a little before, um, the last thing he did to the Plan 9C compiler was try to inject some notion of controlled initialization into the compiler and language. And I don't know if that code still exists in the compiler, but it was, it was there for a long time. It didn't it w quite work. It's actually difficult to retrofit into C. But he kept thinking about it. And when Go started, it was one of the things we wanted to get right. Because initializing your program is very important to getting it to run well. And it's a trivial point, but a lot of languages don't spend any time thinking about it. And you can get in very difficult states with unclear initialization order, uh, random initialization order, and strange behaviors. And the, the, the key point about the main package is that it is the root of the initialization tree. And although it took a long time to figure out how to do it, the mechanism for getting the dependency tree to be executed correctly by initialization turned out to be very easy to do. Although we had a lot of, hard, a lot of thoughts about much more sophisticated, fancy ways to do it that we later abandoned, including doing initialization in the linker. Um, what happens now instead is the compiler generates little bursts of code that execute the init's um, sort of uh, recursively almost, uh, resolving them in the correct order. It's pretty trivial, but it took a long time to get there. Uh, and, it, and as I said, been thought about for a long time. It also has a pretty big effect on how packages work because inits are one of the ways you can get around the strict requirement that there's no circular dependencies. It gives you a, a foothold for that. So initialization isn't talked about much in Go, and it's actually a, a really important feature for how programs are built. It's often neglected. Uh, and of course, I folded two tokens together here. Uh, look, ma, no void. We got rid of void. Um, when you have really good function syntax, you don't need that kind of crutch. It was there because in, in C because, of course, the difficult, difficulties introduced by a change to declaration syntax, but it's not necessary anymore. There's, no, um, there's nothing after this parent. There's no return value from main. It just exits when the program exits. Um, and there's also, therefore, no arguments to main 
uh, in a related point because the runtime handles it. It's kind of an uh, operating system dependent feature. Um, and so we put them in the operating system dependent component and put no return value in to make the function nicer to look at. It also makes the Hello World program shorter, always a benefit. Um, and let me, although this program doesn't have any return values or interesting function argument syntax, let me spend a moment just talking about that because we spent a long time and many versions and iterations sorting out what function syntax would look like, how you specified the arguments, how you specified the return type. There were arrow operators and strange groupings as we tried various experiments. Um, and finally, uh, I don't remember the exact order, but around the time that we finally decided what method syntax would look like, which was to put the receiver inside parentheses, the functions then just became three parenthetical things, the receivers, the arguments, and the return value. But it took several months to sort through that because we're stupid. Um, brace. Well, the opening brace, of course, puts it firmly in the C family of languages. We never considered using white space for indentation. Um, it's, I just think it's a profound mistake in programming language design to have your semantics depend on invisible characters. Um, <laughs> I don't. There, there's, there's a reason for that. Um, I've been burned badly by bugs introduced by invisible characters uh, causing changes in things, particularly when you combine, for instance, Python with, through Swig embedded into C and C++ and various other combinations like that. Um, and we just, it never occurred to us. We were going to make it a nice uh, controlled syntactically uh, structured language. Um, it's also not square brackets. We had a meeting with Sergey after the meeting with Larry and Sergey uh, several months later. I think Russ was at that meeting too. And uh, Sergey asked why he had to type a shift when he wanted to start a new block. Why not make it square brackets? And, well, he didn't win every argument. Um, <laughs> but a good point about this is that there's no new line after the, there's a new line after the brace. It's not before the brace. You can't put it before the brace. This is an unintended consequence of the semicolon injection rules, which went in in December of 2009. Uh, as I said, it was that notion. The way that works, which is that the grammar has semicolons, the lexical uh, analyzer injects them for you under certain conditions. That came directly out of BCPL, although, of course, the rules are a little different. Um, but it meant that you couldn't put the brace on the next line. That was kind of an, oh, sorry. But on the other hand, we do get no semicolons. And we also have to choose where the brace goes anyway. This forces our hand. We consider that a win and GoFund's going to fix it anyway. 